Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the beginning, God created them, male and female, he created them. God brought them together in holy marriage, blessed them, and commanded them to be fruitful and increase in number, to fill the earth and subdue it. But then Adam and Eve sinned. They ruined not just all of God's creation, but the brand new family that God had just created as well. They passed their sinful nature on to their children and grandchildren and every child after them. And, and soon, all of the people that God had created to be his own dear children, they, they were all separated from him. And, and really, they all belonged now to the enemy, to Satan. But God made a promise. God promised that a human child, the offspring of the woman, would crush Satan's head and make it possible for all of the people that God had created to become his children once again. In time, God kept that promise, not just by sending any human child, but by sending his own dear son to live the holy life that God demands and none could give to die a death that would be the only sacrifice that could pay for the sins of all people. And then God sent his spirit through the proclamation of the gospel so that his people might once again believe in him as the one true God and become his children. In time, God sent that gospel to you. In holy baptism, God washed away your sins. He credited you with Christ's righteousness, and he put his name on you, making you once again his child, promising not just to give you life for a little while here on earth, but to give you eternal life in a brand new heaven and earth that he will yet create. While we wait, God encourages us to gather together as a church family. All of its children make up the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, but God knows that we benefit from having people in our lives, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, who will encourage us along the way. We call that the ministry of the church, which includes both our personal or private ministry at home as spouses and parents and children and friends and relatives and neighbors and citizens. It, it also includes the ministry that we do together as a congregation. Whether you're a member or a friend or a guest today, we are St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church. We are connected to one another first by our faith as members of the Holy Christian Church, but we have also connected to one another by our confession. There's a meaning behind the evangelical Lutheran part of our title and also our willingness to serve one another. And so we are also then a, a family of faith. How exactly are we going to carry out our ministry to one another? What's the commitment that we have made as fellow church family members? That's what I want to discuss this week and next week. And I, I propose summarizing that ministry with four keywords. Today, looking at the first two of them, gather and grow. In reality, the verb gather could apply to absolutely everything that we do together because in order to serve one another, we need to gather. However, in this case, that term, I, I'm meaning to, to refer primarily to the, the biggest gathering, the most frequent gathering of the church family. That's worship. It's church. It's what we're doing right now. But why do we gather for worship? Well, the, the first and simplest reason is, is the one that's always the reason, because God said so. I know that reading from Leviticus might, might just seem, again, to us a little out of context, but you realize in the Old Testament how detailed God was in commanding his people to come and worship him, and they couldn't just show up and do whatever they wanted. 
And they had to bring bread that was baked a certain way. They had to bring a certain kind of animal, a year old, male, without defect. So many of a bull, a different goat, a different ram. I mean, there were all of these rules for worship. But one thing was clear. God expected his people to worship them as he should. Because isn't that part of what it means to be God? Because God is God, he demands and he deserves our worship. But our God is not just this mean, demanding God that says, you will worship me or else. No. Our God is a good, gracious, and generous God. And though he can demand all worship from all people at all times, he invites us to come and worship him, not just so that we can serve him, but so that he can bless us. I was a language nerd in school, and so I had the privilege my, my vicar year, my student pastor year, to work at a congregation that had German services every week. Does anybody know the German word for worship, the old German word? You might have heard it before. Gottesdienst. That's another fun word to say. Do you want to say it? Gottesdienst. You don't want to say it? Gottesdienst. You know what it means? It means God's service. But you have to ask, is it service to God or service from God? You want to guess the answer to that? Yes, it, it, it's both. In a word, we come to worship God because he deserves our worship. But when we come, God also wants to bless us. And he does that through this conversation. And, and that's maybe the best way that I would describe worship. I think if you went and asked somebody, well, what's worship? Say, well, there's Bible readings and there's prayers and there's hymns. And we describe all of the parts of worship. But all of those parts actually create a conversation. And if you don't mind, I'd like to just think through that conversation today. First, we come into the presence of God and we do not deserve to be here. We'll come back to that in a second. But we come by invitation. And the first thing we really do after the introductions is we worship God. We, we sing a song just to worship and praise and thank God because he's God. But then we take a moment to recognize that we do not deserve to be here. We have all kinds of different ways of introducing confession, but one of my favorite ways is to acknowledge that God has invited us to come into his presence and to worship him as his dear children. But we don't deserve to do that. Because holy God does not mix with sinful people. In fact, when I come out every week as the bell rings and I stand there, in the, in the presence of God, in, the, in front of the altar, I, I have to stand there and acknowledge that I, I don't deserve to be he, here either. I certainly don't deserve to stand in front of God's people or to dare to speak for God. It, it's, it's one of the reasons, I'm okay really if I wear a robe or I don't wear a robe, I don't really care about that, but one of the reasons we wear a robe is number one, you don't see my mismatched colors or my coffee stains and all of that, but the other reason is to remember, I'm not here because I deserve to be here. I'm here only because God has offered to take away my sins, clothe me with the robe of Christ's righteousness, and he's invited us into his presence. And so we confess that we're sinful, that we've sinned. Today we say that, that everything we do is what we've devised and desired in our hearts, and we haven't done the right thing, and we've done the wrong thing. Lord, have mercy. And then... As the voice of God himself, the pastor has the privilege to announce, I forgive you all your sins. It's as if God himself were speaking. And when Pastor Albrecht was here, that's how it sounded too. <laughs> God, he, he reminds you of what he's already done. He's already cleansed you by the blood of Christ. He's already clothed you with the robe of Christ's righteousness. He's already declared you to be his own dear child. In fact, I think I skipped over one important phrase. Before we confess our sins, we remember our baptisms. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you were baptized. And then in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, God forgives your sins. 
Now it's at that point, today we're a little bit out of order the last few weeks, but it's at that point we would sing glory to God in the highest or some other song of praise to say thank you God for forgiving our sins and bringing us into your presence. And then we dare by invitation again to pray to God. The prayer of the day is usually just a general prayer that begins to focus our attention on the theme of the day. And the theme of the day is just following the church here. Now, not all churches are doing this anymore, and that's not neither right nor wrong, neither here nor there, but, but we follow the church here because from Advent to Pentecost, we focus on the life of Jesus, and from Pentecost back to Advent again, we focus a little bit more on the life of the Christian. So every week after we confess and receive forgiveness, after we offer praise and prayer, God speaks to us. By the way, have you ever noticed that the way the pastor faces mimics this conversation? That when the pastor faces the people, it's God speaking to us. And when the pastor faces the altar, it's the people speaking to God. And so after God has forgiven our sins, we go and we hear God's word. Traditionally, an Old Testament reading, uh, a New Testament reading from the epistles, and then a gospel reading that focuses on Christ. And often in between there, we sing or speak or, or do a combination of singing and speaking one of the Psalms and, and another verse that just focuses our attention on the theme of the day. After God speaks to us, we again respond with a hymn of praise. And then we spend just a little bit of time hearing a further explanation of God's word. Now, I, again, if we had more time, I'd like to ask you to, to answer this, but I'll just have you think about it now. What do you think is the purpose of the sermon? I'm going to suggest in a few minutes that the purpose of the sermon is not education. It's not more knowledge. In fact, I remember one time someone said, Pastor, you know, I really don't need to come to church because you say the same thing every week. I'm like, oh, do I? Or do we? Yeah. What do we say? We, every week you tell us that we're sinful, and every week you tell us that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I guess that's right. Because the purpose of the sermon is the proclamation of law, SOS shows our sin, and gospel, SOS shows our Savior. There's a hundred million different ways that God shows us our sin and shows us our Savior in Scripture, but in the end, we are here to worship God, and that always begins and ends with confession and absolution. And so in a sense, absolutely. Now here's what I said to that person. I said, did, did you, by the way, uh, eat any food yesterday? Did you have like breakfast or lunch or dinner? Yeah. I said, did you eat again today? Yeah. I said, but you just ate yesterday. Why'd you need to eat again today? Well, my body gets hungry and needs more food. But it's the same thing every day. Right. For our body and for our soul. And after God feeds our soul by reminding us again of both our sin and his forgiveness, we confess our faith together. Whether the apostles or the Nicene Creed, we take opportunity to say, God, this is what you have revealed about yourself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now we are going to publicly confess together, this is what we believe about you. And then we present God our offerings, another form of worship. That was the focus of Leviticus 23. We don't have to bring, isn't it great? You didn't have to bring a bull or a lamb or a ram. You didn't have to break bread this morning. You didn't even have to bring any kind of drink offering. And I didn't have to burn animals or pour it out somewhere. It's a big mess. We bring some of the gifts that God has given us. And even if you give electronically, I'm still glad that we always bring the offering plates to the front because what we're doing is presenting our offering to God. And then we offer a prayer of the church, which is for the church as a whole and also for individual members as requested or needed. And then on the best weeks, God comes to us one more time and he offers us the body and blood of Christ in bread and wine. And, and as if we haven't heard it enough or, or because God knows we need it even more, he says here, just to be sure, take and eat. Take and drink. This is the body and blood of Christ given and poured out for you to assure you of the forgiveness of your sins. We sing one more hymn, say one more prayer, and before we leave, God blesses us one more time by putting his name on us. This is worship. 
It's an ongoing conversation between God and his people, a conversation that can never go on too long and we can never have enough. But it's not the only conversation. While God and his people are speaking back and forth to each other, God's people are also speaking to one another. In fact, the conversation between you, between God's people, begins when you walk in the door and you say good morning and you see somebody you know and you say, hi, how are you doing? Or you see somebody you don't know and you say, hi, my name is, and you introduce yourself and we get to know each other better. The conversation continues as we come together to praise God, to confess our sins, to confess our faith, to receive forgiveness, to hear God's word, to pray, to receive the sacrament. And as we leave once again, we do so looking forward to the next time when we will gather to worship our God and encourage one another. That's the primary function of the church. It's where most people come most often. But if I were honest with you, I wish that just as many people would come to grow. Because God also, number one, commands us to grow. That was our verse of the day. Peter said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's, it's really not an option because God knows that if our faith isn't growing, it's shrinking. And if it's shrinking, it can be lost. And then we forfeit all of these blessings that God wants to give us. But, but more than a, a command, it's also an invitation. Even, even Jesus as a 12-year-old boy was found in the temple listening and studying and learning and answering questions because there's always more to learn. I find this interesting dynamic among Christians. On the one hand, most Christians, by virtue of the fact that like most don't go to Bible study, most Christians must be comfortable with knowing enough. On the other hand, when I ask people about the Bible, all oh, pastor, the Bible, it's, it's really, it's, it's a big book, it's hard to learn. So I'm always kind of wondering, do, do you know everything you need to know or is it too hard? There's really only one solution. Keep studying. It, it's also interesting to me that we teach children that when you're a little kid, you should learn Bible stories. Or you should learn about creation and Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and, and Noah's Ark and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and David and Goliath. And, and then you learn about Jesus' birth and all the miracles and all the parables. And, and, and well, you do that when you're a little kid. And, and then when you're in middle school, you go to catechism class and you learn the commandments and the creed and a little bit about baptism and communion. And, and, and then after that, after that, why do we stop? Someone said to me, Pastor, if I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that's all I need to know to get into heaven. Okay. It's true. And yet, God didn't just give us John 3.16. He gave us an entire book. When you think about it, because God is omniscient, the book's really not that big com c compared to the fact that God knows everything. I mean, you've seen Encyclopedia Britannica, right? Unless you're 13, then all you've seen is Google, but you get the point. This is it. There's so much to learn because as Paul prayed about the Ephesians, God wants you to know him better. Paul prayed that God would give his people the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they would know the riches to which God has called them, that, that they would know God's incomparably great powers. Here's the challenge that I have. Number one, I can't remember most of what I learned. Number two, when I know what God says, I still struggle to fully trust in it and live according to it. And that's where I think the benefit of Bible study comes in. It's not the same as worship. I know that in worship, you hear God's word every week. And even with an extra long-winded Pastor Berger sermon, you're still getting like only 30 minutes a week. It's, it's really, it, it's not enough. You don't have time in worship to ask questions. You don't have time to tell us what's going on in your life or to find out what's going on in someone else's life. In Bible study, we get to dig in. In fact, we, we almost always run out of time trying to dig in to the small section of scripture that we're studying. And there's all different ways to do it, right? My least favorite Bible study, by the way, is pastor-led. I already talk too much. You need to hear me talk some more. 
but that's kind of traditional. We also now have life groups where people get together in a pastor prepared study and, and they simply get to say, here's what's going on in our life. Here's what we heard in the sermon this week. How do these things fit together? And then right now, Sunday morning is kind of a mix between the two where you get a chance to study one of the judges at a table with some people that you can get to know. And then I also stand up and we, we have a, a pastor-led conversation on top of it. It doesn't really matter how you do it. It happens at home too. When you read your Bible on your own or with your spouse or with your children or with your neighbor or anyone else, you just keep reading and asking the Spirit to deepen your faith. Yes, your knowledge but more so your faith and your ability to trust and live according to God's will. God wants you to grow. So who are we? We are St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church. We are part of the Holy Christian Church, but by ourselves we are a family of faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritual grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and cousins, and people who I pray will learn to love and care for one another. That begins as we gather every week around God's word and sacraments for worship so that we can give God the worship that he deserves and he can bless us with forgiveness and guidance and love and word and sacrament. I pray that that conversation continues as we grow together, whether it's in a Sunday morning or Thursday morning Bible study or a Monday night life group, or if you're just reading your Bible at home with your family, I pray that God will continue to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And then I pray that you will join me as we ask God to bless each and every family within our congregation, to bless our congregation as a family, and then to bless our ministry as we gather and grow. Next week we'll learn the next two words. For now we say, Amen.